All right, hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. Tonight, we are in for an exciting teaching. This is something so many of us in, in Bible prophecy have been seeking to understand for a long time. And guess what? As you would expect in all of the revelation that's been happening here for six and a half years, you guessed it, Jesus is telling us exactly the same thing we have been teaching here for the past several years and you're going to witness it here tonight i'm not just going to go right into it i am going to lay it out for you guys i'm going to build on it so that you guys can see and know and understand for yourselves that it's not kind of what jesus is saying but that it is absolutely what jesus is saying so we're, we're going to build on it, and even though some of the things that we're going to build on, those of you that have been around for a while, you'll have heard these things, but it's being done on purpose because I know not everybody, even some that have been around for two, three years, maybe don't have a full grasp of what it is that I'm sharing, and so I, there, there has to be repetition. To get good at anything, to, to understand and really sink things in, you need repetition and you need to go and seek it out for yourselves. That's why I spend so much time on these things. That's why there's so many tabs, as you can see, that are open. I mean, from here to the end is all for tonight, just about to the end. So it's it, it's going to continue to build. It's going to lead. It's going to lead. It's going to develop and it's going to keep revealing itself to you. And then when we start to get into it, you'll see it right there. But along the way, about just as we start to, to get into the point when I go to that part, as you'll see from the title, The Four Months, just as I begin to go into it, I'm going to break into a piece of a group of people that's represented within it. And I'm going to show some stuff that I was talking about with our sister Ima. I did a Zoom with our sister Ima uh, several days ago. And um, uh, we were talking about some things in relation to the bride and, and just some different points. And there was some great points in uh, the seven churches and, and specifically who they're speaking to as a beginning and who they're speaking to as an end in relation to that remnant, what we call worker bride. The pre-trib group goes and a portion of them remain to work. So that's going to be tied into this. And then I'm going to jump back and finish the story with the four months and show you what it all reveals. It's pretty wild. I'm not saying that I have all the answers to everything, but what I am going to show you is what the four months is all about. And you're going to see it clearly written for yourselves. And, but, you know, there are some things, you know, when it comes to the feasts that are still a head scratcher. I mean, when you go from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, I, I was debating going into some of that tonight, but even myself, I, it, it's been like rewiring circuits in my brain because there's some things that are clearly different to what we've all been told. And that's nothing new here, but to what we've clearly been told has to do with Feast of Weeks. Yet the conversation of what's really happening there is not the same when we read what other things tell us about the Feast of Weeks. So... We're, I'm going to save that. i got to study a bit more. That one was just, I mean, I've been praying on it and praying on it. I've been contemplating and digging and seeking and searching. And, and I could feel that I'm close. I'm getting little nuggets of it. But there's still something that, that I need before I can really begin to go in and share on that. And you're going to love it. You know, for those that are in uh, the Ministry Revealed forum, uh, you will have seen. So anybody that wants to join the forum, they can go to ministryrevealed.com right here. It'll bring up our website. You can click right here in the menu. Click on forum, and it just takes you a few seconds to sign up. It's free of charge. There's about 1,200 people from around the world. News, events, activities, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> news, prayer requests, uh, Bible studies, uh, shares, all sorts of things, inspiration, like-minded brothers and sisters, seeking, watching, and praying, diligently searching for the Lord, uh, ready for when he returns. If it's tomorrow, fantastic. If it's a little bit longer, we'll be ready. No matter what the date, we'll be ready. I believe we understand the time frame. I believe it is 2024. We've shared on those things. 
But tonight is going to be another confirmation of the timing of it. So you can come and join us there if you'd like. And um, yeah, so what I had shared in the forum was, you know, over the years, many of you guys have heard me talk about when I have showers. So when when I when I have this, you know, I'm I'm diligent and I'm seeking the Lord and it doesn't happen all the time, but it has happened quite a number of times over the last six and a half years. And lo and behold, this one happened on the 8th of February uh, that this came about. I wasn't pondering John chapter four. I was I was just in thoughts in, in other things, but I had pondered momentarily, like just for a few minutes when somebody had posted a comment in the forum about John chapter four again. And so I posted a little comment about it and left it at that. You know, it's been something that's kind of been been at us for a little while, as it has many others who seek the Lord in prophecy. And there I was minding my own business and prayers and in thought with the Lord. And boom, it just popped into my thoughts again in the shower. Just bang. It just jumped into my thoughts, not even thinking about it. And I knew what the answer was. All I had to do was go look at it in scripture, put it together. And I was like, oh, <laughs> there it is. And so I laid it out in the forum. But, you know, it might sometimes be a little bit harder to track. But it really isn't very difficult, especially for those that have been around for a little while that that have that have already really grasped these things. Uh, you'll see it and understand it right away. It's about everything we've been talking about. So that's what we're going to get into. We're going to break that all down and I'm going to open with something uh, um, just that I was uh, I was talking in com in uh, in private messages with our brother Ivan in South Africa and. There's one piece I'm not going to share tonight because him and I are going to talk about it uh, later in the week. But there was one piece that he did bring up and I went to look at and I thought it was a great connection. Again, proving this period of time that we're talking about, but in, in down the road, you know, what we've understood in tribulation. So I, once as we get going, I'm going to open up in there. But where I want to start is, as I usually do, <laughs> look at this video, right? 1400 views over the last 1300 views over the last four days man people don't like the 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 conversation of once saved always saved you know i really wish more people would have gone in to to listen to the whole video because it's not only this once saved always saved it's it's about what caused all of these things what what was the what was the cause of all of these misunderstandings you know, it's not simply once saved, always saved. When when the scripture says other things, you know, it talks about, you know, salvation in Christ alone and through the blood of the cross. But then it also says faith without works is dead. And it also says if you continue in these things. And so if there are two points, you can't disregard one and stand on the other because they're both in scripture. Well, that's the same thing. And it's what I go into then talk about more of which is the same as, as people who debate pre, mid, and post. Yet all three of them can debate with Scripture their position on pre, mid, and post. Why is that? How can they debate against each other when all of them can go to Scripture and show with Scripture the ones that are true, being pre, mid, and post? Well, we have the answer. We have the revelation. We know that pre, mid, and post are true. You see, even though some people have them in the wrong spot and so forth, the answer is they're all true. That's why they're all in Scripture. And so that's what it also goes into in the video and why it's actually quite powerful, much more than just the, the whole once saved, always saved issue. It's the all-encompassing idea of how these so many churches have come to be divided. How there's 40,000 or so denominations because they all see something and then somebody else sees something in Scripture. And so that one goes against that one. It says, no, it's this. And the other one says, no, it's that. You see, it's it, uh, without going all the way down this road, you know, it's the same with uh, the Baptists, right? The Baptists say you have to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, like Matthew 28. But. You go over to, to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, I think it is. And it's to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
And if you go to a Baptist church and you want to be baptized in the Acts 2 one, they pretty much kick you out. What are you talking about? We don't baptize like that. You see? Why this division? How could there be both in there? There has to be a reason. Well, we understand that one too. It's the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. It's realizing that even though all Scripture is for all of us, there are certain parts that are speaking to different groups of people. Period. That's, that's the revelation. That's how the revelation started. And that's why I always tell everybody, when you first come to the ministry, if you're new or newer and you haven't seen the very for the, the first four videos in this uh, playlist here on YouTube, the Revealed End Time Study Note series, then you don't have a clue what we're talking about. There's no way you can if you have not taken the time to at least watch those four intro videos. Okay? And that's something I also share. You can always also go here to Ministry Revealed, the intro right here on the website. And when you come here, it's the same four videos, the first same first four videos in order. This is a 22-minute intro of the next three videos touching on things that you're going to hear about. And this is where it all began in September of 2017 here. It's called Who the Gospels Are Speaking To. All of these differences in the Gospels that people think are contradictions, they're prophecy. They are prophecy and we prove it in dozens and dozens and dozens of cases. And this one is a 30-minute intro Bible study to some very simple, key, clear ones to begin to help you to understand. This is the difference of the groups that are being spoken to. There's a pre, there's a mid, there's a post. Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days is Luke, Mark, Matthew. The last will be first, the first will be last. John stands, his own, stands on his own, and there's a reason for that too. It's fascinating. It's mysteries hidden since the creation, since the foundations of the earth that are being revealed. And we are so blessed. I am so grateful. I'm honored to have a part in the will of the Lord in this and that each and every one of us can take part in it and just share it as anywhere we can with whoever will listen, even though that's not easy. All right. We now know it's not going to reach everybody. We know there's a group of people being prepared here. All right. What you'll come to realize after this, <coughs> excuse me, is this next 30-minute Bible study that will reveal that what the world thought was seven years of tribulation is actually called 14 years. It is seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. You'll see Luke is pre, Mark is mid-trib at the end of his portion of seals, Matthew's is the post-trib at the end of his portion of trumpets. The truth is 100% unequivocally revealed in scripture from the beginning of creation to the end of tribulation to the end of the book of revelation it is 14 years and this is just 30 minutes to begin to give you some understanding in it then this one is the big one this one's about two hours and 45 minutes it's all because of matthew and that's the answer to everything now i don't believe pastors were, were purposely skewing things and everything else i believe the lord hadn't yet revealed the time and that's why it wasn't revealed, because we've all been taught over hundreds of years from the Gospel of Matthew, and Mark and Luke were looked at as just other places to add insight and points. That's called looking at Scripture in the is. But what people haven't understood is why the differences within the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And because everybody's foundation comes from the Gospel of Matthew, they only see seven years of tribulation, 7,000 years of creation. And in those seven years of tribulation, they say it's Jacob's trouble, the seven years for Judah. Problem is, because they've only learned from Matthew and not understood who Mark was to, they failed to realize that Mark's is the first seven years. That's the differences in the discourses too. So this will really, really help to open your eyes to understand the revelations that were beginning to be revealed before that. Once you understand those, you can go deeper. This is a big one, three hours or so going into the differences in the Gospels. Then you'll be able to understand the differences within the discourses revealed, going from Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Luke is a period of time called above 14 years, which is the 40 to 50 day period. Then it's Mark, seven years of seals, Matthew, seven years of trumpets. 
you will understand those differences within the discourses as well. And then you could see pre, mid, and post. It's absolutely fantastic. I promise you it'll be worth every moment of your time. I promise you. It is all scripture. It is all spirit-led. Now, as we get going, I want to share with you guys our brother Steve in Uganda. You see, they, they print the Ministry Revealed book. Guys, they've been printing these things like crazy. Buying Bibles, of course, more Bibles than our books. My book's nothing without scripture, right? So the Ministry Revealed book, the Bibles first, but they're not printing them, of course. They're buying the, the Bibles. They're printing Ministry Revealed books, and they're printing a book by our sister Cindy uh, about, a, a, about testimony. And these things are going around Uganda and the surrounding areas by the thousands. And our brother Steve just had a huge event in Uganda. Now, these are older pictures, but he just shared with me. He, the, this is a small group. These are small groups. He just had an annual event that he has about this time every year. And in this event, they were expecting, so last year, I think they had about, they were expecting about 500 or so, four or 500, and they got 700. This year, they went back, and he says the, the ministry has been going viral all over Uganda. They're crying out because a lot of them now have Bibles, but they're seeking more Bibles. They're, they're asking for the ministry revealed books, for the Cindy testimony books, salvation, and all of these things. So it's salvation. It's the word of God. It's salvation and readying them with the understanding of Scripture through the Ministry Revealed book. And he just had an event that they'd been planning for three months. It's a big event. So instead of hitting seven districts around Uganda, they have one event and seven districts come to them. They were expecting 1,400 people this year. He said it's been going viral. And from these uh, 1,400 they expected, they had over 2,500 people people show up 2500 people could you imagine this is our brother steve right here and he's got a team with him guys we are the ones that support him through ministry revealed we're the ones that support that provide the bibles the food the travel the 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 medication the clothes all of these things and you guys have been so so awesome could you imagine expecting 1,400 people and 2,500 plus people show up? Do you realize they got to find accommodations for these people? Now they don't put them up in hotels and motels. They find all surrounding local churches within a few miles that they have agreements where people can come and just sleep in the churches. They had to add over 1,100 people, including food. They didn't have enough food and he was in a panic. And somebody went and got a bull. Could you imagine? A bull. They got a bull. And roasted this big bull to help feed the additional people. It was incredible, guys. And Steve, our brother Steve there and his team, they are sharing from the truth and the word of God in the truth of salvation, the way it's meant to be done. And it is fantastic to see that Everything is exploding there. He said they didn't have enough Ministry Revealed books and Cindy books to be able to send there because they were expecting, uh, I think, two or three hundred or something like that, uh, pastors and leaders from other churches that were coming to this. They had 700 <laughs> because they're growing in their understanding of Scripture, too. And so Steve is there and his team. And they had breakouts all over the place for people to break out and learn in this section and another section over here to learn. And they were teaching on this and they were teaching on that. It was incredible. And so one of the guys actually stayed behind so that they can keep printing more books so that they could ship them. Once these guys were, were getting ready to leave, they'd arrive and then everybody can go with their books. It's incredible, guys. And you know who made this happen? Well, of course, the Lord first. We give all glory to God first. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Spirit working through each and every one of us. Our brother Steve and his team there on the ground. And the thousands and tens of thousands that they're reaching because of your prayers and your support. Craziness, guys. It is such, such a blessing. And so if you want, always be praying, of course, for each other. 
and over the ministry. And if you ever want to support, PayPal is here, GoFundMe is here. You can do it in the links under this video or right as you saw from the YouTube page. You can just click right here and the links will pop up. It, it's, <laughs> you know, uh, our sister my, our sister Cindy was asking me the other day, you know, who would have thought, you know, when when this ministry started, first of all, I didn't even expect to have a ministry. I was I was a business guy, small business, creating products, doing all sorts of things. And till the Lord says, nope, now it's time you work for me. You know, it, the switch changes, you change inside, your spirit changes, and everything changes. If you would have told me seven years ago, I would there would be a ministry that I would be a part of in growing that I would have a book and it would be spreading throughout parts of Africa and Uganda and those surrounding areas and different parts of the world through the brothers and sisters and a ministry with 10,000 people around the I would have said, man, <laughs> you need another drink or something. You have no idea what you're talking about. But you see, when the Lord says it's time and he's, he's ready to use you, it's your time, man, oh man. And I couldn't have done any of this without any of you. You know, if I didn't have brothers and sisters like you guys that we can share and bounce things off and go back and forth on, oh man, why would I do it, right? Why would I do it if it was only me? Because it's not about me. It's about all of us, right? It's about all of us who are diligently seeking, who are thirsty and desiring the truth in the word of God. That's what we're doing. And we've just been so blessed with what he's given for us to understand. Incredible stuff, guys. I'm so, so grateful. So thank you all, always, and I always pray for you and yours as well. God is good. All right, let's keep going now. This is the part that I wanted to share with you guys. This is a piece of scripture you all know very well here in this ministry. It's, it's connected to the revelation of the 14 years. And in fact, just to speed up my computer a little bit, let me close that off. <laughs> it's a very well-known verse. And it's Psalms 90 and 10, okay? My computer's going really slow. So let me go to this in here, in my favorite eSword anyways. eSword, Psalms 90 and 10. This is uh, what I was talking about with Ivan. Ivan had shared this with me and in relation to another piece of scripture as well that we're still going to talk about, but I want to share this one with you. So we've shared on this many, many, many times. We know that the 70 to 80 is 10 years, which means at least 10 years of tribulation. Then is, their, then is their strength. If you can last past 70 and go to 80, it's labor and sorrow, which means travail, tribulation. It's, it's all about tribulation over those 10 years. Then it is, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. This has nothing to do with pre-trib. This is Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. This is about 10 and a half years into the 14 years of tribulation as Revelation 12, 14, when they fly away, <coughs> excuse me, on the wings of an eagle. But look at this word cut off. This word for cut off means a lot more than what we see right here. And this is what I wanted to share. This is what Ivan was talking about. Watch this. This word for cut off also means <clears throat> to pass through, to pass over to pass over well isn't that fantastic it has a connection to passover and what do we know about it there's your beginning of your 14 years of tribulation starts at the red horse rider i believe at feast of trumpets day and hour no one knows feast of trumpets 2024 you have seven years of seals three years of trumpets there's your 10 years and what do we say it's about three and a half years into trumpets when messiah gets cut off and when they get cut off in the 11th year, which is about 10 and a half years in, the soon cut off, if it starts at the Feast of Trumpets, which we have proven and know that it does, then what does it mean if your 10 years, which would be Feast of Trumpets, right? Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, what would be six months later? Passover. Passover. Soon cut off, meaning a few months, which would be about six months, and there's Passover. Why does it make so much sense? Why does it line up exactly with everything we've been proving over the years? Because you go to Matthew chapter 24. We know in Mark's discourse, the abomination of desolation is the mark of the beast during seals. But the mark of the beast or, or the abomination of desolation 
in Matthew's gospel, in his discourse, is after the three and a half years of the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple. This abomination of desolation, when they're to flee into the wilderness, is the one that is in the 11th year or the 10 and a half year mark, which is just as Psalms 90 and 10, Passover. See how that works? <clears throat> it's amazing. Every time little, little niches of things are found within the definition of the words, bam, there it is. Every single time. Now, let me start with this today. Let's get started with this and, and remember this, okay? I'm opening with this because it's really not only the beginning of the story, <laughs> it's the end of the story and the beginning of the end of the story. <laughs> Many of you guys will know what I'm talking about. So this is from the Gospel of Thomas, from the Apocryphas, right? So this is the Gospel of Thomas, and it's about the words that Jesus said when he was talking to disciples and so forth. Now, I'll start down here at this one, and then we can go to this one to make a point. So this is what Jesus tell, is telling them. In 17, it says, I shall, give, I shall give you what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no hand has touched and what has never occurred to the human mind. The disciples said to Jesus, tell us what our end will be. Jesus said, have you discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. This is something we've broken down over the years, right? A sister had shared it a few years ago, and we know what this is all about, don't we? Whoever finds the beginning finds the end, and will not taste of death. Well, we know something about that with Enoch, don't we? From Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So those who are in faith, right, in Christ, spirit-filled, are going to receive a reward if they're diligently seeking him. And connected to the pre-trib, it's those who will not taste death. Who are the ones that won't taste death that'll be like Enoch? It's connected to those who will take part in the beginning. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. Well, what do we know about in the beginning? Genesis chapter 1, right? Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning. We know what that beginning is, right? We've understood what that beginning is and what it means. These three parts to the creation stories. It's fantastic. So we've understood this. And, and there's a reason I'm leading you into this because it'll all tie back in together at the end. What's the other part that we see in the Gospel of Thomas? It says in verse in 16, it says, Jesus said, men think perhaps that it is peace which I have come to cast upon the world. They do not know that it is dissension which I have come to cast upon the earth. Fire, sword, and war for there will be five in a house there will uh three will be against two and and two against three father against son son against father and they will stand solitary you see why is this important why is this even connected to the beginning well we know it's connected to tribulation again these are things that we've understood you see when john the baptist came jesus already said in the is so what you have to understand is there's the was there's the is, and there's the is to come. The was is from creation until Christ. From Christ is the is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. And then from the moment of the pre-trib to the end is is to come. 
So there's the was, is, and is to come. In the is, Jesus said that John prepared the way. And when he prepared the way, what did he do? He brought fathers and sons together, mothers and daughters back together. Yet there was Jesus saying, I've come to bring division. How could Jesus say that he's come to bring division when John was the one to bring them together so that when Christ came, they'd be ready? We know what the answer is here. It's prophecy. It's prophecy. It's things that still are to be fulfilled again in the end of days. Look at what it says. We know that this is a picture of just right at the beginning when the is to come is about to start. But listen to what he says. Luke 12, 49, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I, if it be already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. Suppose you that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth, there will be five in one house divided, three against two, two against three. Father will be divided against son, son against the father, the daughter, the mother, and so on and so forth. This, you see, when Christ came, he's talking about bringing division. Yet at the same time, John the Baptist came first to bring them together. That means, that means the division part was, was now supposed to end. But now we've got a picture as, as it builds in the is to come. We know that when the tribulation begins, there's now going to be division again. Because when the Son of Man comes for 40 days after the pre-trib returns after the wedding and is here for 40 days in that above before the 14 year starts, we know that he's coming to bring division. And we know that during the time of seals, that group that's going to follow him, that remnant bride that remains to follow him, and then will work during seals with the revelation of understanding, with the anointing of Holy Ghost that we call Acts 2.0. We know <clears throat> and have been able to reveal that this group within them is a John the Baptist type. They're going to work during seals, and what are they going to do? They're going to reunite father and son, mother and daughter, so that when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of seals, he's going to receive them into paradise, the mid-trib great multitude rapture. So you see, how could Jesus have been coming to bring division when John was the one that reunited? It seems so clear to me that, that this type of conversation is, is all about prophecy. And that's what these things were in relation to what he's talking about. So when he's saying he's going to bring fire, sword, and war, what does that sound like to you? The time of seals, maybe? That's exactly what's happening. So I just wanted to add that into the beginning because we're going to see this, this, you know, this beginning and end and end from the beginning, and whoever finds it will understand these things. Because it's very, very important, as you're going to find out. So now, let's go into the meat and potatoes. Let's, let's get this thing started. <coughs> in relation to what Jesus is talking about in John 4. Even though we got some scripture to cover before we get to John 4. Here's something we've shared a number of times. Okay? There are two. Let me repeat again. There are two wheat harvests there is one called spring wheat and there is one called winter wheat even in jerusalem for thousands of years the jews know this yet what you're about to witness is where the jews have gotten all twisted up in it and we can show why they're twisted in it and it's all because of the story of winter wheat and spring wheat and who they relate to <clears throat> all right so what do we know spring wheat is what is called new wheat okay it, it's like uh it's like the younger it's called spring wheat it's it's the new wheat it's planted in spring sometime generally after passover and it's not ready until late summer early fall Winter wheat is planted in the fall, 
and is harvested in late spring to early summer. <coughs> Winter wheat is called old wheat. And this old wheat is like being older. It doesn't mean it's old and it's no good. It's just the older one. There, there's no restriction on it, and it can be used right away. Okay? These are things we've shared on quite a bit. Let me just continue to prove this out to you a bit more. What about in the Middle East? Typically, winter wheat in the Middle East is planted in the fall between October and November and harvested between May and August. Did I make that up? No. This is from USDA.gov 2022 from Middle East sources. So what does that mean? It says winter wheat is harvested late May to the time of August. This is the time of the harvest. In 2024, because the, the Hebrew calendar and with the movement of the sun and the moon and everything else, it's going to be beginning in about mid-June. But let me give you an example. If I go back to 2023, you're going to see that it starts in late May. You see? So it depends on the year. And this year, based on the Hebrew calendar, it'll be mid-June, whereas 2023, it was late May. And what did it say? May and August. So from May through August is the time of the wheat harvest. Which wheat? Winter wheat, of course. You see, winter wheat doesn't isn't ready to harvest until late May to about middish June. That is the beginning of the winter wheat harvest. And this winter wheat was planted the year before in late October, November, maybe even sometimes into December. Okay? And it starts to grow in late spring and it's ready to be harvested in i should say earlier spring and it's ready to be harvested in late spring into mid-june spring wheat on the other hand is planted usually around passover or just after passover this is a second adar year it's planted generally around april April, maybe even into May. It's planted generally in early spring. It's not ready to harvest until around mid-September to early mid-October. Every single year, that's how it works. One is called old, which means winter, and one is called new, which represents spring. <clears throat> Let me show you another thing. Here's from Britannica. So a bi uh, um, an encyclopedia definition. Spring wheats planted in early spring grow quickly and normally are harvested in late summer, early fall. Winter wheats are planted in autumn and harvested in late spring, early summer. See what I'm saying? I'm not making this stuff up. I want people to be able to see it. I want people to be able to process it. I want you to be able to understand and to see how the two wheat harvests work. The winter wheat <clears throat> planted in the fall is called old wheat. It, it, the reason it's called old wheat, another picture of it is like um, somebody who's older. You see, it was planted first. So it's older. It's what? The first fruits, right? First fruits unto the Lord, the older before the younger. That's what's going on. Spring wheat represents new because it's the newer, it's the younger one. And winter wheat, being older, being the firstborn, is the first fruits that goes first. Winter wheat is the younger, and that's the one that goes second. This is the picture that we're getting, and you can now see clearly for yourselves the timing. That we see winter wheat planted in the fall is ready to harvest 
between late May and middish June. That is when it's ready to begin to harvest. Spring wheat or new wheat is planted in the spring, generally around Passover time, and is not ready to be harvested until later September into middish October. It's like that every year and has been like that for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of years. Okay? We can see it. Now, what about wine? Well, wine, we see right here, uh, wine, mem uh, wine maker, da -da -da -da. the process takes a few months, often from August, which would be late August, through October or November. And it's actually even later than that. Okay, watch this. I, I shouldn't say later than that, but a bit more specific. You see, when the first cool of the season, generally between September and October, is the time of grape harvest. So what you're seeing is that in this same period of time, generally September to October, is when the grapes are ready to harvest. Well, what else was I just showing you is ready to harvest in this same period of time? Generally September into October of any given year. The new wheat. The, the new wheat, the younger, the, 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 the spring wheat is harvested at the same time as the wine, as the grapes for the wine. They're ready at the same time. The old wheat is ready to be harvested in late spring to early summer every year. There's no grapes ready at that time. <clears throat> it's a harvest on its own. Okay? Now, what about this one? What about barley? Barley is the earliest one. Now, what you find out is that barley is planted at the same time as winter wheat. Well, how about that? Winter wheat that's planted in the fall you see, wheat, the major grain of winter, and barley are planted at the beginning of October to the end of November. Okay, they're planted in the fall. Harvest usually begins around May and June. So barley, because it grows even faster, that's the one generally around Passover time. They're still green ears of corn, so it's not fully ready to be harvested, but they're green ears of corn. Okay, that's barley. And what happens is barley grows, and then there's the harvest of barley, and it finishes the barley harvest right around the same time in here. Barley comes to an end, and then the winter wheat starts. Interesting how they're planted together, and they're both old, and they're both what? First fruits? first fruits of the wheat harvest and there is a first fruits of the barley harvest which is the feast of first fruits do you know there's a there's a great piece of uh of scripture or uh, in the apocrypha in uh the book of jubilees watch this um watch this where is it uh i think i can do i have it already set nope watch this Watch this. The Festival of Weeks. Okay? In, in the Book of Jubilees, the Feast of Weeks is simply called Festival. Okay? So whenever it's a feast of something, it's called a festival. So look at what it says. This is all about the third month. Okay? There's the third month. It says, in this month. Okay? In this month, Feast of Weeks. Look what happens at the Feast of Weeks should be in this month, which is the third month, once a year for a renewed covenant. Pretty awesome, right? 
for a renewed covenant. We know that when Moses was in the third month and he was at, uh, they were they were in the wilderness and came to the mountain. He went up to see the Lord. He ended up getting the tablets. Right, he got the new covenant. Well, let's keep going. Remember what I'm telling you about here. What I'm making a point on is that barley and winter wheat are both planted in the fall and grow together and, and take root and are dormant during winter and then bang, start growing. The first of the first fruits is barley, which is the feast of first fruits. And then we have the first fruits of the feast of weeks, which is wheat. Interesting that there are two first fruits. One for the feast of first fruits and one for the feast of weeks. Interesting, right? Because that first fruits, remember there's a group that remains when Christ comes and they remain with them. They're that first fruits of the group going pre trib. First fruits with the first fruit. They're both older. And there they are both with the first fruits. You're going to start to see this connection come to be more and more clear. But I thought that was pretty interesting that uh, here is the one day of year, a year, which is the Feast of Weeks. In this month shall they celebrate this festival. Listen to this. For it is the Feast or Festival of Weeks. Listen to this. And the Festival of First Fruits. This is a head scratcher. I am not going down this road, <clears throat> but to say this is this isn't just the first fruits of the feast of weeks. This is the feast of weeks. This is the this is the feast of first fruits. This this isn't the first fruits of the feast of weeks. This is the feast of weeks. This is the feast of first fruits. And the book of Jubilees says that the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Weeks are celebrated together. For this is a festival of a double nature, of a double kind? In the third month? What? I find that very interesting, and it, it, it warrants much more digging. And you want to know why? Because out of all the festivals that we have, Passover is on the 14th day. Uh, unleavened bread is seven days from the 15th day. Uh, trumpets is on the first day of the seventh month. Atonement is on the 10th day of the seventh month. Tabernacles is on the 15th day of the seventh month for seven days and then the eighth day. The only two that don't have a date is the Feast of First Fruits, of which there's your first fruits. Jesus, the beginning. And Feast of Weeks, which is also just a count, and it is the one, the Feast of Fruits, uh, First Fruits, sorry, it is the First Fruits with leaven, which relates to the First Fruits of the crops. Jesus is the beginning, barley, and the First Fruits of the wheat harvest of the Feast of Weeks is this group, and that's the pre-trib group of which a portion remained to stay with the Lord for 40 days and then work during seals. But neither of them, neither of these first fruits has a date. Listen to what it says even about the Feast of First Fruits in Leviticus 23.10. Uh, about midway, when ye come into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof. Then shall you bring in a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So, when do you count it? When when you're first harvesting? Where 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 is this specifically? It's always been believed that it's got to be you know the the sixteenth day of the first month of Nisan. 
because for us we know that that's resurrection day and jesus is the feast of first fruits he is the first fruits so then why <laughs> why is the book of jubilees telling us that the feast of weeks and the feast of first fruits are celebrated at the same time in the third month yikes right that's a head scratcher that is a a big head scratcher that needs some more attention and we'll go into that attention uh a little bit later maybe in a in in a couple videos or in a video from now we'll see how the lord leads it but that's kind of very interesting isn't it because you're going to see as we go further into this that there's an issue with what the jews do as i had mentioned earlier there's a clear issue with where they begin to count what they call Shavuot or Feast of Weeks. You see, Festival of Weeks. They literally call this Festival of Weeks. Why would they call the Festival of Weeks at the beginning of the wheat harvest? Do you know that that's impossible, right? They call this the seventh Sabbath, right? And the 50th day for Shavuot. And then the church twists it and goes a little bit further and even calls it Pentecost. Do you understand as, as what I was telling you and showing you, this is only the beginning of the wheat harvest. The Feast of Weeks isn't at the beginning of the wheat harvest. It's at the end. How do we know? <clears throat> we'll get into it. Scripture literally tells us. Literally tells us. Okay? So, what is all this difference within the winter wheat and spring wheat conversation that we have? And why do I share it so often? Because it's an absolutely phenomenal revelation about Leah and Rachel. You see, Jews love Rachel. Jews love Rachel. They all favor Rachel. They all want Rachel. All of them. You go talk to a Jew and say, would you rather Leah or Rachel? 100% of the time, they will tell you Rachel. They always dismiss Leah. And that is fed into their feasts that they have messed up. It's so awesome. You see, because who is Leah? Leah's the older. The younger is Rachel. What does older mean? Firstborn. Firstborn. The first fruits, the, the elder, the, the winter wheat called the old wheat. The one that was planted in fall is ready in late spring, early summer. And when it's harvested can be used to make bread right away with leaven. The younger is Rachel, and he couldn't have the younger before he had the older. Rachel is the spring wheat that is planted in the spring and is ready late summer to early fall. It's the difference between pre-trib firstborn Leah, the Gentile bride from Luke, and the younger Rachel uh, um, mid-trib connection to the great multitude rapture. These are things that we've shared on many times over the years. We've got the pre-trib right at the beginning of the 50 days, which is the Leah type. And then what happens? He, he gets Rachel, but he has to serve seven more years for her. And then she starts having the kids, right? Well, what ends up happening is 
What's the picture of? Well, every year there is, of course, a winter wheat and a spring wheat harvest. But in the big picture of what they represent as Leah and Rachel, it we're not talking about it year to year to year to year. We're talking about what they represent <coughs> in the big picture in the harvests of the Lord. And Leah, as you're going to see, even with the feast that's had for her, it too was at the Feast of Weeks. Now, what happens with the Rachel type? Well, Rachel, even though in the annual story of winter wheat and spring wheat, it's a few months later, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the same year a few months later. It's representation of the new Leo, uh, uh, the new spring wheat being Rachel is the one that represents the great multitude mid-trib rapture at the end of the six years of seals. The mark group, the great multitude rapture. It's not going to happen at the feast of weeks like it did for Leah because Leah represented winter wheat and Rachel represents spring wheat. Their harvests, not the, not the fact that they happen every year, every year, every year, but their harvests are a pre-trib picture and a mid-trib picture. Okay? And what did we see in relation to them? We saw that the Leah winter wheat feast of weeks harvest and it stood on its own, right? Or it had a connection potentially with the first fruits of the barley, which is Christ. Hence, they're Christ and they're with him and then they're working for him. And then what do we see at the end when it's time for the great multitude rapture? At the end of the sixth year of seals into the seventh year of seals. We see that the spring wheat, which is the Rachel now ready for harvest, what do we see? We also see wine is ready at the same time. And what do we get in Revelation chapter 7? We have the 144,000 that are the representation of the grapes. And we've got the great multitude rapture representing the spring wheat of Rachel. Okay, let's keep going. You're, you're going to see how this flows together. Much of this you've already understood before. So that's what's going on in this story. We see that it starts with, with Jacob at the well and Haran. We see the, the relation to uh, winter wheat and spring wheat. We see that the winter wheat, the older, the firstborn goes first and that he has a wedding with a feast that he makes and that this wedding is where he has to fulfill her week. It's the wedding week of Leah. And remember, to the Jews, just like to Jacob, he didn't want Leah. He wanted Rachel. He didn't want the older before the younger. We're going to see how this directly ties in to how the Jews have observed their feasts and what Jesus is saying in John chapter 4. So, when we come here now, check this out. Again, in the book of Jubilees, look at what it says. It says, and Israel arose from Haran. There's our connection with Haran. From his house at the new moon of the third month and came to the well of Oath. Huh, that's, that's what we were just reading in, in Genesis 29 with Jacob, right? And offered a sacrifice to God uh, of his father Isaac on the seventh of the month. Okay? 
on the seventh of the month. He's offering a sacrifice where we would say the eighth. Don't get too ahead of yourselves. I want you to remember what I told you in the beginning from the story of the book of Thomas. Whoever finds the beginning finds the end, for in the end there the beginning is, and they won't taste of death. Okay? In our day and age, because of the movement of the sun over thousands of years, this Sivan, in June this year, is the third month. Okay? So as we're following this story, we see the well of oath. We see it's the third month, seventh day, you know, seventh to the eighth day there. Jacob remembered the dream which he had when he was Bethel, feared to descend down to Egypt. And while he was thinking uh, that he would send word to Joseph that he should come to him and that he would not go down, listen to this, he remained seven days. So what's he doing? From here? He's remaining seven days. What do we know this relates to? <clears throat> it's what we've shared on many, many times from Luke chapter 12, verse 35 down. This is where Jesus is speaking to that remnant group of workers right before the pre-trib happens, and he's about to take the Leah group out for the wedding. In the pre-trip, he says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find him, shall find watching. Verily, I say unto you, he shall gird himself and make him to sit down to eat and will come forth and serve him. This is the first watch group that's with him for 40 days when he returns from the wedding and then will work from the anointing of the Holy Ghost will work during the time of seals. We've broken it down many times. The second watch is the 144 and the third watch are the tribes during the millennial reign period. We've broken it down. We've got many, of it, many videos on it. So what do we know? We know that there's a seven day period where there's a group waiting for when the Lord returns from the wedding and he's going to knock and he's going to come to a banquet with this group to sit with them and serve <clears throat> and eat with them. All right? We, we've shared on this before. And this is what we're seeing here. Third month, well of oath. It's Jacob, the seventh, I would say the seventh to the eighth. And then he remains seven days where he's where he's in wait and he's contemplating what to do. Just like the first watch group was told when the Lord returns from the wedding, we know it's seven days. And then what happens? The Lord returns on the eighth day. And what's happening during this time? And he celebrated the harvest festival of first fruits with old grain. Did you hear that? He's celebrating the harvest festival during this week wedding represented by Leah's with old grain. Old grain, which as you saw, is winter wheat. Celebrating with old, <clears throat> excuse me, with old grain. So again, we're seeing it everywhere connected to the third month. So according here to Jubilees, in the story of Jacob, there's the well of oath. It's the third month. It's Jacob. He remains for seven days. Festival of old grain. What's that, what's that the story of? Just go read Genesis 29. There's Nahor. There's the well, right? He comes to the well. He, he sees Rachel and then ends up getting Leah, the older before the younger. 
we see that then a feast is made and this feast is for the older which is the old grain because it relates to the firstborn before the younger and he has to fulfill her week according <clears throat> to jubilees this is at the feast of weeks the feast of weeks is this offering and then there's the seven day wedding and then look what happens the lord appears on the 16th day well what do we show we show the same thing we show that if this was see that seventh to the eighth you have your seven days of the wedding and then the lord shows up on the 16th <clears throat> always remember what i'm sharing you here on this calendar is based on the hebrew calendar having adjusted to the sun and now calling this nisan two months earlier which would make savan month three if this is how it were to play out then this would be our pre-trib as we've said before remember i said there are two watches in any given year going forward it's either that the hebrew calendar is correct and god has made his adjustments for it which i don't believe is true which would bring us to right here as the third month offering to the lord which is the pre-trib and then you have your seven day wedding taking place as the leia wedding week and then there's the lord showing up on the 16th day of the third month which is when the son of man would come to begin his 40 days all of this clearly there for us in scripture and in the apocrypha of jubilees perfectly aligning with the wording and everything spoken about in genesis 29 and we understand what the difference is between winter wheat and spring wheat however i want you to remember that this doesn't make sense as we said the jews have it here whereas we would have it here but it doesn't make sense that this is the festival of weeks because it would mean if that was the festival of weeks it would mean that from here the counting of seven sabbaths one two three four five six seven sabbaths would mean that the wheat began to be harvested right here Do you see the dilemma? Are you are you already beginning to see this dilemma? There is no zip zero zilch wheat that you can begin to harvest in late March to April. It's impossible. There is no wheat to harvest it does not exist i showed it to you from the dictionary i showed it to you from from usda from middle east harvests it is impossible to start harvesting any wheat right here any wheat it's impossible Yet they're counting the Feast of Weeks from the seventh Sabbath, right? So this becomes your first. So from the morrow after the Sabbath, right? There would be your count. There's your first Sabbath. And then you come to your seventh Sabbath for their count, which they would put right here. 
I believe the true count is the eighth. But there was no wheat to harvest for those seven Sabbaths. It did not exist. The wheat will not be ready to harvest until here. And this is the first wheat of the year, which is the old wheat, Leah, when it will begin to be harvested. You see the issue? It's impossible that they call this the Feast of Weeks. 100% impossible. How, how can we say that it's absolutely impossible? Well, let's see what Deuteronomy 16 has to tell us. Deuteronomy 16 says, Seven weeks, in verse 9, Seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as you begin to put the sickle to the corn. The corn is wheat. Okay? How do we know? Well, listen to what the next verse says. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with the tribute of a freewill offering of thine hand. Okay? It tells you it's the feast of weeks. It tells you it's the feast of weeks. What does that have to do with knowing that corn is wheat? Well, let's see what the Bible tells us about it. In Exodus 34, 22, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. See, the feast of weeks is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. It's what? The first fruits of the wheat harvest. What is the first fruits? The first fruits is the older before the younger, right? The firstborn. And so what is the Feast of Weeks about? It's the harvest of wheat. Which means in Deuteronomy chapter 16, when it says, seven weeks shall thou number, and you'll begin to number those seven weeks from when you begin to put the sickle to the corn, it means you're starting to count these seven weeks from when you begin to put the sickle to the wheat because it's the Feast of Weeks count. It's wheat. Do you see the dilemma now? Do you see how they count seven weeks from here? They give you an Omer count. Let me do a refresh. It might show up. No. You do it. They do their Omer count from the 16th of Nisan. And they do it and they do it and they end up right here. And they call it the Feast of Weeks. This is where they observe the Feast of Weeks. Did, did, they, did they put the sickle to the wheat? Ask anybody on earth. Go to any farmer. Are they putting the sickle to the wheat? In in midish March, uh, uh, April, and this would be late this year. No. They will tell you that if they have winter wheat in the ground, that it's just starting to grow. They would tell you if they were doing spring wheat that no, it's how can I do that? I've just planted it. So it's 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 completely impossible to begin a seven week count to the feast of weeks when they haven't even put the sickle to the wheat you see the dilemma you see what the problem is i'm i'm i'm, I'm trying to reiterate i'm trying to go slow i want you guys to be able to grasp it and take the time if you haven't fully grasped, but I'm gonna I'm not done. But take the time. Rewatch it again if you have to. Pause and, and seek it out. They can't do this 
from the time of March, April, like they claim to be doing every year. They have no wheat to begin to cut. It's impossible. It's impossible. You see what's happening? It's impossible. So as I was breaking this down to show you what what um, Jubilees was talking about, I was showing it to you from where the Hebrew calendar has the third month and what they would claim is the Feast of Weeks. So what you've just seen is the evidence that this can't actually be the Feast of Weeks. It's not even a maybe. It's not even kind of. It's not sort of. It can't be. You can't do it when this is when the wheat is about to get the sickle put to it. Which means this is the time when the sickle is going to be put to the wheat. This is the time. Which means seven Sabbaths begin from here. Seven weeks begin from here for the Feast of Weeks. You'll see what's coming. So what was really awesome, I think I had mentioned this to you guys earlier. So what is ClickUp? Click up this, is this is the video right here, old before new, mind-blowing revelation. Check this out. It was from September 8th, 2022. You see this conversation. Uh, I mentioned it here in, in the message, in the posting. Age before beauty, right? It's like the expression, age before beauty. Where do you think that probably came from? I suspect it's probably from the Bible story of Leah and Rachel. He wants the younger, the beauty first. But no, what do we say? We say age before beauty. Right? We call it alphabet because of Aleph Bet from Hebrew. All of these things that we use are just hidden within meanings from Scripture. It's, it's all over the place. But February 8th. That's pretty interesting because it was February 8th. When the Lord, when the Spirit dropped it in my mind when I was showering on the 8th. That was just like a, an interesting side note. Because as soon as I came out of the shower and realized that the revelation of John chapter 4 was this video, I went to go look it up. And it was the same date two years later. Interesting little coincidence side note, right? So if you haven't seen this video, feel free to go watch it again or to go watch it. Okay. Now, let's see how this all plays out in relation to John chapter four. Okay. And I'm going to start. Remember what I said? I'm going to touch on John chapter four and I'm going to go off in another little direction. And then we're going to come back to it and finish up the story of it. Okay? Let's go to John chapter 4 in Esword. And let's see this storyline. So we see it's what? The Samaritan woman, right? Samaria, Samaria. Oh, look at that. Jacob's well. A Samaritan woman, Jacob's well. Now, look at what, look at what she says. You're a Jew and, and, and you're asking me for water? Since when do Jews ask me, a Samaritan woman, right? A woman from Samaria. Since when do Jews want to ask me? And where is he? Oh, they're at Jacob's well. They're at Jacob's well. And there's a woman <clears throat> that says, but you're a Jew. Jews don't talk to us. Jews don't care for us. Remember what I said? Leah and Rachel, right? The older before the younger. Jews want the younger, beautiful one. And they always disregard. They want nothing to do with Leah. 
And here's a Samaritan woman. She is a 100% picture of the pre-trib bride, the, the Gentile Leia type. And she's from Samaria. She's from the tribes of the north. And what are those tribes of the north? They're part of the tribes of the ten tribes of the north of the house of Israel. And the Jews want nothing to do with them, right? They care for Rachel. And here Jesus, a Jew, is taking this time with this woman that Jews would disregard because they only care for the Jewish, right? The, the Rachel type. That's the conversation going on here. He's at the well, which is Jacob's well. He's talking to this Samaritan woman. And what do we know about the story with the Samaritan woman or Samaritans in general? Look if we go to John, uh, Luke chapter 17. Let's see if we can find an interesting connection to add to this story. How about the ten lepers? Luke 17, 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria. Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there he met ten lepers men how many are from the northern area outside of judah the ones to the north with samaria are 10 tribes right 10 tribes what is a what is the picture of the 10 tribes but the house of israel to which the gentiles are grafted into now called the world because they're scattered everywhere and Gentiles are mixed in with them. There's 10. There's 100% of them. And what do we know about this story? All 10 of them, like the whole church, is declaring Christ and is claiming salvation because they've been healed like the 10 lepers in Jesus's power and authority. So all 10 were saved. Just like everybody claiming Christ as their Lord and Savior. Okay? And what happens? And where 10 lepers stood afar off and Jesus lifted up his voice their voice uh, sorry, and they lifted up their voices and said, "Jesus, Master, have mercy on us." And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. Bang. All 10. 100% were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Interesting, right? The Samaritan, just like the Samaritan woman, the ones that the Jews don't want anything to do with, which are a portion where the twelve, where the ten of the twelve tribes are. And here we have a picture of the ten represented in the ten lepers. And the one who's a Samaritan is the one who returns to give glory to the Lord. And what does Jesus say? And Jesus answering said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. A stranger. Foreign. Not a Jew. The foreigner. The, the, the Gentile type, right? The Gentile representation grafted in. Out of all of the 10 tribes, which is now represented by the world and the Gentiles grafted in, and they're scattered throughout the whole earth, 10%. 10%. 1 in 10. 1 1.5 billion declare Christ. 150 million return to praise Him and give Him glory and worship Him. I believe that number is 1.44 billion total and 144 million that are represented as that 
10% stranger. And Jesus then says, and he said unto him, arise, okay? Arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made you whole, delivered. What do you think that means to the other nine? Wouldn't Jesus be saying to the other nine, depart from me, I never knew you? But we were in your presence. You healed us. This kind of ties into the last video I did, doesn't it? So what are we seeing? One in ten. That is the representation of the first fruits, 10% that are going pre-trib. It's the Luke group. It's, it's the Leah. This Samaritan who's a stranger, non-Jewish, of the 10 represented by the world of the church, 10% who are as Enoch, diligently seeking the Lord in Christ, worshiping him, giving him thanks and glory. You see, she's the same. In, in John chapter 4, she's the same representation. That one was like Leah in Luke 17. In John 4, she is like Leah and more, even more closely like Leah. What is a Jew coming to talk to me for? Why would a Jew do this for me? It's directly related to the difference between Leah and Rachel because the Jews don't want anything to do with the Leah types. And that Leah type in that woman is a picture like that Samaritan man. One in ten. One in ten. And look at what it says. <coughs> Excuse me, as we go down, and I mean, look at this. Those that honor in truth, right? Verse John 4, verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. What did that Samaritan do in John in Luke 17? Same thing. The one returned, fell at his feet, worshiped, and gave glory to him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I know Messiah cometh, which is called the Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. Huh. There's another picture, right? That representation of not only the pre-trib bride being taken out as the 10% first fruits Leah, but as a group remnant working. He will tell us all things. But now let's keep going. Listen to this. We're not going into the four months yet. Okay? I'll read through it. Starting in John 4, verse 35. Say not ye... There are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receive wages, and he that gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth, <coughs> excuse me, and he that reapeth rejoice together. Check this out. This isn't something that that uh, Ima and I were talking about, but I'm tying it in with it because it's directly related. Check this out. When for somebody who's new, <clears throat> you'll have heard me say that, you know, when it comes to the Luke, Mark and Matthew and the chapters speaking to different groups in the books and how John stands on his own, it's because John gives us a prophetic picture of what we call the big picture of chapters to years, okay? That's what's going on here. There's a picture within chapters to years. So if everything begins at Feast of Trumpets 2024, we end up getting this picture that plays out. And we get this within all of these different books. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we know is that there's a remnant group those Leia types that remain with the Lord that we've been talking about, that first fruit, a, a portion from them remaining from that 10% that goes. And 
They're going to remain with the Lord, be with them for 40 days. He's going to give them understanding of all things. They're going to receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And what's going to happen? They're going to put their necks on the line during the time of seals. And some of them are going to die. Okay? And in fact, I can even show you that, which will prove that their wheat also will get to it. And what do we know about them? that put their necks on the line and die for Christ during this time. We know that they're going to take part in the resurrection of the just and will rule and reign with Christ during the millennial reign. When does the Lord return? At the very end of the 20 here, which is the end of the 13th year of, of tribulation or the end of the sixth year of trumpets <coughs> to right at the beginning on this line to the beginning of the 14 years or to the beginning, I should say, of the 14th year. Right on this line. So you've got 20 into 21. And we know, <clears throat> excuse me, that a group of people, when the Lord returns, will take part in the resurrection of the just. They will be the first, they will be part of the first resurrection. And they are the, those who put their necks on the line for the Lord during the time of seals. Okay? So look at what it said. Those that reap, receive wages, and gather fruit unto eternal life, so that he that soweth and he that reapeth rejoice together. This word, rejoicing together, at the same place or time, is only used three times. Which means, what, when you see something like that, what kind of insight can we glean from that, <clears throat> seeing that if this is to be understood as the seals workers who are part of the, 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 the wheat that are going to be putting their necks on the line, working during seals, that are connected to this wheat harvest, which I'm going to prove to you which wheat harvest it is, that they're going to be taking part of what? The sowing and the reaping because they're the ones working during seals. And that for putting their necks on the line and taking part in these things, they're going to rejoice together with the Lord. Well, let's see where this word shows up. It's used three times. Okay, there it is. G3674, there it is, John 436. And look at that. John 20 and John 21. Why does that matter? I'm not going to go off in a big offshoot in relation to where it's all broken down and what it means. but what do we know it means? What have we been able to show from it? It's related to right here. John 20 to 21. Who takes part in the resurrection after the 13th, right? 14th in the big picture, that 20 to 21st year, which is John 20, the end of John 20 connection to John 21. It's those who will take part in the first resurrection, right? Remember that? Look at it. Look at what it says. Look at who they are. Okay? They're the ones that are connected to the harvest that's four months early. And they're going to be part of those who are going to receive wages, who are going to be working to sow and reap, and they're going to rejoice together with the Lord. I'm going to prove to you that this relates to a specific wheat harvest. Check it out. If we go to John chapter 12, where is John chapter 12? Look at where John chapter 12 is. <clears throat> John chapter 12 is related in the typology to the fifth year of seals. What do we see? Now, I'm not saying it's chapters to years. So anybody that's new, uh, sorry, I'm not saying it's one seal per year. Okay, that's not how it works. But I want you to get this same picture of what happens when we get to the fifth seal. Get, here we are, Revelation 6, 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held, saying, when are you going to avenge our blood? Okay? And it says, not until their fellow servants also 
and their brethren should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So fellow servants, having been killed under the altar at the fifth seal, we come to John chapter 12, and what do we get in John chapter 12? Watch this. Uh, John 12, verse 24. Remember, we're going to prove out John chapter 4. Listen to what it says. Starting in verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat. Except a corn of wheat, a kernel grain of wheat, fall into the ground, fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, see, serving the Lord, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Who are these guys? They're, they're a corn, a, a kernel. They're, they're a grain of wheat, a corn of wheat, falling to the ground, dying, having put their necks on the line. What are, what, what are they? Who are they? They represent the same group we've been talking about, which are related to those that would be glorified with Christ. Remember this from, from Luke uh, sorry, from Romans chapter 8. We come to Romans chapter 8, and we see this same group that will be glorified with Christ. Those that are in Christ, spirit-filled, the ones that we see in Romans 8, 14, that are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God, waiting for the, have the spirit of adoption. Verse 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs, <coughs> excuse me, with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him. What is this suffering with him? That we die as he did. That we would die also serving him. John chapter 12, what's happening? That time of seals. <clears throat> Those who are under the altar who died for the name of Christ and for his witness and testimony. That they may be what? Huh. Glorified together. There's your together. There's your glorified. There's your suffering. It's that portion of the Leia group <clears throat> that's chosen to remain behind. And what were they called? They were called grains of wheat. They were called corns of wheat. They were called corns of wheat. And it's through their death, their sacrifice, that as the Son of Man is glorified, so shall they be glorified. Because remember when Christ came, he died for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This group, this, this first fruits of the wheat that remains, is working for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They are serving the Lord to bring in the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which is Mark's group, the mid-trib great multitude rapture, which is connected to spring wheat, Rachel. This is what's happening. But now you can see that it's connected to corn and wheat. And this group that we see of who they are is, again, this group we were talking about 
in Luke chapter 12, when he tells them, let your lights be burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he returns from the wedding. This is that first group. This is that portion that he's warning before he takes out the Leah winter wheat group. He's warning this group that would be a part of them saying, you've been chosen to serve me. They've been prepared. They've been diligently seeking, watching and praying. Okay. And then he's going to sit down, serve them and eat with them. We've talked on this many times, right? Well, look what happens when we go to Revelation chapter three. What is Revelation chapter three? Well, we're still living in the is. The is to come doesn't begin until <clears throat> the moment of the pre-trib. When the moment of the pre-trib begins, the seven churches will begin again. It'll start with the 50 days, starting right at the pre-trib escape, and the Lord will anoint the apostles, and the 50 days will begin. But until that pre-trib happens, we're living in the Laodicean age, as we've said many times. So right before the tribulation starts, it's the Laodicean age. When the tribulation then starts at the pre-trib, the seven churches start all over again. And when the 14 years come to an end, that 13 to the 14th year, it's still the Laodicean age until the Lord returns. Okay? So it's the Laodicean age now, right until the moment of the pre-trib. And when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, it'll be the end of the Laodicean age and it'll all be over. So we can grasp something here from Laodicea, and maybe we can get an insight into what's going to happen just moments before, <clears throat> excuse me, the pre-trib escape and the seven churches starting all over again with the 50 days. Well, look at what it says. Revelation chapter 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come in to him, <coughs> excuse me, and sup with him, and he with me. That's exactly what we read, right? That's exactly what we see in Luke chapter 12. He tells them to be ready when he returns from the wedding, that when he returns and knocks, they open unto him immediately, and when they do, he will come in, sit, and serve them, and eat with them. So this is what we see going on right at the end so this is a picture here right to the end <clears throat> of the is of the laodicean age that's because he's is this is the evidence right here connected to luke 12 that he is going to pre-warn the remnant group that will serve him that are going to be chosen to remain this is the evidence of it okay now we go to Luke 24. Who is this group? I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We know who that group is because out of the differences in the Gospels, only Luke's group, which is the two on the road to Emmaus, represented as those disciples, who he's going to sit with, to eat with, and serve. He only does this out of the Synoptic Gospels with Luke's group which is the pre-group that was chosen to remain, that when he returns, he begins his 40 days, he will knock and serve them and eat with them, which we have shown is the story after the wedding when the pre-trib group is taken to the wedding and then he comes back and he has a banquet. And this banquet is that group of Luke 24, is that group from Luke chapter 12 and this group when he has this banquet their recompense is going to be at the resurrection of the just again something we've broken down many times who are those that have part in the resurrection of the just well of course we know it relates to Smyrna okay so even in the seven churches this is the beginning of the 50 days but this is the 40 days starting after the seven day wedding Smyrna is, of course, represented 
by the group when it says, I know thy poverty and so you'll suffer many things. You'll be, some of you shall be killed, put in prison, some of you killed, right? But it says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. They're the ones taking part in the resurrection of the just. We've been able to show this, of course, by going to Revelation 20, which is a picture of John chapter 20 going into 21. When what happens? When the Lord destroys Satan, Satan is bound, destroys all the enemies. And what happens in chapter 20? Satan is bound, and then who gets resurrected? The ones who put their necks on the line, who did not take the mark or the image and so forth, the ones who were his servants are going to be resurrected to reign with Christ a thousand years. But all of the rest of the dead, none of the rest of the dead, okay, none of them, Live again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Only this group, which is the Smyrna group, are going to be the ones taking part in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. So you can see, they work, they're with him at the beginning, they work with him during seals. And who are they? They're the first fruits as he is first fruits. They're the older before the younger, right? Jesus is the first of the first fruits. These guys are the first fruits. The only ones that are the first fruits are the ones who are the Leah, who are the winter wheat. They are the winter wheat. And they are a portion from among the winter wheat chosen to remain and serve the Lord. And their reward, having worked during seals, is that they're going to be part of his glory and they're going to be part like john chapter 4 said let's go to john chapter 4 that they're going to what rejoice together with them in that resurrection of the just of the first resurrection and they're going to glory with them and what are they going to do they're going to reign with them why does that matter well now think of Revelation chapter 3, Laodicea, how we saw that the verse 20 was about the very end. This, this Revelation not 3 verse 20 is the confirming verse of Luke chapter 12, 38, <clears throat> 39, and 40, I think it is, telling them that he's going to meet with this group first to let them know. So that they won't be terrified when the pre-trib group goes and they're left. <clears throat> because they were diligent, loving the Lord and repentant and everything else. This is the evidence. But when the seven churches have played out again, and we're now at the end of tribulation, at the end of 13 years to start the 14th year, and Satan is destroyed and bound, it's now the end of the is-to-come Laodicean age. And let's see what it says about them now. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. So what is this group of workers being told that they're going to serve the Lord at the beginning of tribulation? What's their work? What's their reward? That they're going to rejoice together. They're going to be glorified as Christ, having suffered with Christ to bring in his group, which is the Mark group, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which the Gentiles are grafted into. And what's their reward? They're going to have part in the first resurrection. And what are they going to be doing? Reigning with Christ. So if they're going to reign with Christ, what do you think they get? Here you go, brothers and sisters. Try to, try to let that sink in to our brains. Let that sink into your thoughts, into your minds, and into your hearts. 
that the remnant group of workers from Leah, the winter wheat, that's going to be chosen to remain and serve the Lord, who will put their necks on the line during the time of seals, who are the winter wheat seeds, the wheat that will die and go into the ground, that will in itself produce more fruit, are the ones who will take place in the resurrection of the just. And when they do, they are co-heirs with Christ. Reigning with Christ, being glorified as Christ was. Because they're serving Christ in the same capacity, putting their necks on the line for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And what is their reward? Try to wrap your thoughts around that. That your reward for whoever is a worker during seals, obedient, diligent, serving the Lord, willingly putting their necks on the line. Yours is going to be granted to sit with the Lord in his throne. Head explosion. I'm reading it from scripture. It was discerned and this, these things have been understood for a long time. We've revealed these things and just added more and more connection and more and more connection. Those who will serve the Lord during the time of seals, putting their necks on the line, having been his chosen servants, are going to be sitting in the throne with the creator of all things. What? Only those who are co-heirs can do it, who have put their necks on the line as he did having died for us. We will be dying, but not with the same power that Christ had, but we will be dying for his people, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, during the time of seals. And our reward is the first resurrection to reign with him as co-heirs being glorified together with him in his throne. Shut the front door. You see, this is the type of thing, even though I understand it, and and we can prove it and we can lay it all out my 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 mind simply can't wrap its head around it because when i think of the lord i don't just think of his saving grace and i'm sure same with you guys i think of all the way back to the beginning of creation and everything that was is and is to come that he created and did that the father gave all to him and he went and created it all and whoever the remnant workers are of seals, which I believe a group here is unequivocally being prepared to do, which is why we've been given so much revelation, to prepare us for when the time comes. In his throne? To sit with him in his throne? Man. That's that's a that's a hard one to wrap the mind around. I'll tell you that much. That is extremely difficult to wrap your head around. All right. Now watch this. Let's keep building. Now we're going to go back to John chapter 4 and connect this thing about the four months. Okay? Now that you've grasped, now that you should be able to grasp the difference between the two harvests when they're ready, physically ready on the earth and happening okay not guesses not guesses absolute happening on the earth and spoken about in scripture deuteronomy 16 9 seven weeks thou shalt thou number unto thee begin to number the seven weeks from such time as you begin to put the sickle to the corn what is corn now now you know it, stock of grain, but this stock of grain, there was no corn in Israel back then. This grain of corn is wheat. 
we now just saw that the connection in John 4 was wheat. <laughs> we saw that the ones who are putting their necks on the line, who are dying in John 12, are corn represented as the kernels of wheat. This feast of weeks, we don't have to try to figure out if it's saying feast of weeks. It tells us it's the feast of weeks. And the feast of weeks is a seven week count to what? To the feast of weeks. But it can't begin until the sickle is put to the wheat. I showed you that the sickle cannot be put to the wheat until late May to about midish whoops late May to about midish June of any given year not only did I say that the Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that the .gov for the USDA in the Middle East harvest tell us the same. What wheat is the only wheat that can be harvested between May and August? Winter wheat. Winter wheat, which is Leia, in 2024, would begin to be harvested right here on the 8th of Savan. This is <clears throat> the beginning of the harvest. You're going to now see and understand how <clears throat> the Jews have mixed it up by saying this is the first week. Because now you can understand with your own eyes, with your own understanding, that they could not begin to put the sickle to the wheat to begin to number seven weeks to the Feast of Weeks back in March to April. 100% literally not possible. So why do they do it? We'll get to that. Why do they do it? So what we're seeing is that in 2024, this is the time frame when the sickle is put to the wheat. When the sickle is put to the wheat, you're to count seven Sabbaths, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oops, where am I? Uh, 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 what is it? Uh, seven Sabbaths. Why did I mix that up? From the wedding, uh, from the wedding, seven Sabbaths. What did I mix up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sabbaths. That's right, because it begins the count right here. So this is your. What did I mix up from when the Lord comes? We've showed what that count is. I don't know. I've suddenly had a, 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 a brain fart. We know that it brought us to the 8th of Av. Okay? So what do we know? The harvest goes from late May to mid or mid-June. It starts in that time frame. This is when the winter wheat begins. Okay? This is the beginning of the winter wheat. And it goes to what? Generally into early August, late July to early August, which is exactly what it tells us. Winter wheat planted in the fall, harvested in late spring to early summer. That's when the beginning of the harvest is. The beginning of the harvest is always late spring to early summer every single year so when we see that the feast of weeks 
is telling us there's your seven weeks from when you put the sickle to the corn. Look at what comes next. We go to John 4. John 4 tells us, just as the story of Genesis 29, as we shared earlier, we see it's Jacob's well, we see Haran, we saw the same things from the book of Jubilees. There's Haran, third month, well of oath, uh, uh, seventh day of the month, Jacob. When people read this, they think that the connection is the Hebrew calendar that brings them to this point right here. That this is the third month, seventh day. He had the seven days, and then the Lord showed up on the 16th. But do you realize that in, in Genesis 29, do you realize that the beginning of the year wasn't where it is now? Do you realize that that um, that in Genesis 1, in the beginning, the beginning of the year wasn't where it is now? Remember what I said to remember at the start. Jesus told them, <clears throat> tell us how our end will be. And he says, have you discovered the beginning? That you look for the end. For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his part in the beginning. He will know the end. He will know the end and will not experience death. <clears throat> what is the beginning? When What about Moses? In Moses, Moses, Exodus chapter 12, when God told Moses, this is, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year. When he told this to Moses, where was the sun? You see, in the beginning of creation, where was the sun? In the beginning, when he told Moses, where was the sun? When these were taking place and, and Enoch was taken, which was at the Feast of Weeks, where was the sun that began the year? When he gave the law to Moses, where was the beginning of the year? When, when it was the third month in Exodus 19, where was the sun that started the year? In every single case the sun was in Taurus to the Hebrews Taurus was the first constellation of their zodiac consequently it represented the first letter in their alphabet Aleph so if they know that Taurus began the year for them in the beginning if God told Moses this is the beginning of your year if Abraham, if Jacob, if all of them were following based when Taurus was the beginning and God led every single one of them from understanding that Taurus with the sun in it was the beginning of the year. Do you think it's possible that it still is? Now. We know. We know that the sun has gone off by two months, and now Nisan is the beginning of the year. Right? So they've, they've made this adjustment for it on their calendar by moving it two months. Do you think if Moses was here? Do you think if Abraham was here? Do you think if Enoch was here? Do you think if Jacob was here? Do you think if any of them was here who all knew the law or from when the law was given and knew when the beginning of the year was, that if all of them looked up at the beginning of the year where the Jews tell them it is in Nisan, and they said, see, it's in Pisces. What do you think every one of them would say? Uh, no, it's not. 
the Lord God told me that the beginning of the year started in Taurus. In fact, you guys have already declared that you knew it. You already know that your alphabet begins with Taurus, with Aleph. Why would you try to tell me that the beginning of the year is Pisces? That's not the beginning of the year. The Lord God himself, the Lord God himself, Moses would say, told me <clears throat> that the beginning was Taurus. What do we do with that? Well, it's pretty fascinating in this ministry because you guys know the story. In 2020, from March 10th to the 11th, I received the revelation confirming Taurus. I had no idea, <clears throat> but it was confirmed by the Holy Ghost. The one event that I've had like that, that confirmed Taurus was the beginning. Taurus was the beginning. And that's where I mixed it up. I was saying this was the beginning of the of the wheat harvest. No, this is the beginning of the wheat harvest. This right here is, <clears throat> you see, when, when the Lord told Moses in Exodus chapter 12 that this is the beginning of your month, the beginning of your years, he was telling them in Taurus. And he said, you know, the 10th day you do this. He said on the 14th day is the Passover, right? We know this would be the picture in relation to the crucifixion. And this is what? This is the beginning of your seven Sabbaths. Okay? To the Father God, this is what I'm telling you. To the Father, he has never changed. I've said it a, a dozen times. If you took the clock on a, on a watch and you went one you went one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve do any of those hands do any of those numbers one through twelve move they never ever move the minutes and the hour hands move so the sun and the moon move and the sun has sped up by two months. And so because of its having sped up, it's now pointing at 11 instead of one. It's pointing at 11 and everybody is saying, see, this is the beginning of the year. And they're doing it because agriculturally, this would be the time that they have to start planting. This is what's happening. But the father is saying, look, and Moses would be saying, look, why are you telling me it's 11? <clears throat> why would you say it's 11? The father told me one o'clock. So I'm going to wait till I see one o'clock, which is Taurus. And that's the beginning of the year for me. That's why it was so powerful when the Holy Ghost gave that one confirmation that you guys know the story of. So what happens is we know <clears throat> that in the beginning, again, why was this so important? Because we know in the beginning of creation, in the beginning, it was Taurus' 16th day. And what do you do in this connection, who is the beginning, who is Jesus, the sheaf of the first fruits of the barley wave offering. That's what he represents. The first fruits, <coughs> excuse me, the first fruits. What do we count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sabbaths, seven weeks. That's how we got to that, to that time. Now, why would we count like this? Because we're told in Deuteronomy 16. We're told in Deuteronomy 16 that seven weeks begin to be counted 
from when you put the sickle to the wheat. We know that the sickle being put to the wheat is the feast of first fruits of the wheat harvest. First fruits is the firstborn. It is Leah. It is the older before the new, which means winter wheat. And when does it happen? When you put the sickle to the wheat. When is the feast of weeks? Is the feast of weeks in 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 the fall? No. The feast of weeks begins to be counted. It begins to be counted in late spring to early summer. Late spring to early summer, it begins its harvest. It is the beginning of the harvest. And in 2024, it's connected to the latter, mid midish, late June. When this harvest begins, you count seven Sabbaths. And you come to what? Late summer. Every single time, right? That midish to the late portion of summer, right? Because it could be late July into midish August. This is all the wheat harvest of the Feast of First Fruits of Leah. It is harvested starting late spring, early summer. And the harvest ends in middish late summer. The spring wheat, the Rachel spring wheat, does not begin to be harvested until middish September to about middish October. That is the Rachel spring wheat harvest time. Okay? What is connected to the timing of the spring wheat Rachel harvest time? Grapes. Right? Grapes. Grapes are the same time. Grapes are the same time. Generally in that September, October time frame, just as spring wheat is. Okay? So if Rachel, spring wheat, and grapes are ready at the same time, what if we go look at what Deuteronomy 16 says again. There's your feast of weeks, and in your feast of weeks, from the beginning of the harvest, when you put your sickle to the winter wheat is what it is, it's seven weeks, and then you're going to observe the feast of weeks. Now, it seems crazy, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem a little bit strange to you? That even though Savan in the Hebrew calendar in our modern day is the third month, isn't it odd to you that when you count the seventh Sabbaths, you get to the fifth month, eighth of Av, and the Hebrew calendar, we're in the fifth month? Yet, according to Jacob, according to Abraham, according to Moses, according to the beginning of creation, this isn't really the fifth month to the Father. This is the third month. You see? It's the third month, according to the Father. We're living in an age where the sun has gone off course, but we have to understand the correction because we had to find the beginning to find the end. Whoever finds the beginning will find the end and understand it. Look at the third month, the well of oath. Jacob <clears throat> waited seven days, celebrated first fruit with old grain. When is the feast of first fruits with old grain celebrated? It can't happen in the current third month of Savan. So it so happens 
that when we stick to what the father called his first month, that when he said was the beginning of creation on the 16th day in the month of Taurus, which is Savan in our modern day, which is late May to June generally, but always in June starting, this month of Savan, which is Taurus, the Hebrew month of Savan, to the Father is the first month. To our current way of life because of the Son, it's actually the third month. Yet, when we count seven Sabbaths from the beginning of creation, which was Taurus, 16th day, and we then count from that first fruits of the feast of first fruits, we count the seven Sabbaths, we end up on the eighth day of the current fifth month, which is called Av. But the Father says, no, that to me is the third month. How can we prove? How can I claim such a thing like this? When is wheat ready? When, when is wheat ready? When, when is wheat ready? Over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. The winter wheat doesn't begin to be harvested until the middle of Savant, May to June. And the seven Sabbaths don't end until midish August in 2024 at the 8th of Av. I want you to grasp, and I'm sure you are, but I want to hammer it in and get you to understand what I'm saying. Even though the sun has gone off course by two months, the harvests of the Lord God's model, which is now the time going to be the first fruits of the wheat harvest that goes first, that has seven Sabbaths being counted first that will begin from when wheat, when the, the sickle is put to the wheat, it still lands exactly on the Lord God's calendar that begins on the 16th day of Taurus. Do you understand? Do you get what I'm saying? Even though it's called the third month to the Jews now, to their Hebrew calendar, to the Lord God, this is the first month. And from this first month, from the 16th day, which is when the, the sickle from the, the wave offering, the sickle is then put to the wheat, seven weeks are counted, and it's literally the end of the winter wheat harvest, it falls from the third to the fifth month on the Hebrew calendar, and God calls it the first to the third month, which means the feast of weeks of the third month is in the month of Av, and we have the exact story from Jubilees. We have the exact story from Genesis 29, and all of these three stories, the one from Jubilees, the one from Genesis 29, and the one from John 4, Jacob's well, the Samaritan woman, who are you, a Jew speaking to me? Because Jews wouldn't speak to her, she would be like a Leah, nobody wants her. Jacob, the well again, the well, Jesus says, Say ye not, there are yet four months and then comes harvest? What, what harvest would these guys be looking for? Jesus is saying that they say there's still four months to the harvest. What did they say when they saw Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman? Ooh, what's he doing speaking to her? What did she say? Why are you speaking to me? A Samaritan, you a Jew. 
because the Jews wouldn't speak to the Samaritans. They wouldn't speak to, to that portion of the 10 of the house of Israel. So to the Jews, he's saying, you guys say there's still four months. I'm telling you to lift up your eyes because the harvest is white all ready to harvest. John 4. Look at what he says. You guys are saying there's still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, lift up your eyes. Look, the fields, they're already white. They're already what? Luke. <laughs> I love that. They're already Luke. That's Leah. That's the pre-trip. They're already Luke. They're already white and ready to harvest. See, not already harvested. They are ready to harvest. Check this out. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16. I'm going to show you the other wheat harvest. Feast of weeks. There it is. Put the sickle to the corn. When? At the actual feast of weeks. No, no misunderstanding. Feast of weeks. Feast of weeks. The sickle is put to it in the Hebrew third month on the 16th day which is Taurus, okay? Well, let's see what it says next. What happens when we go to Feast of Booths? When is Tabernacles? Tabernacles is in the seventh month. What does it tell us in Deuteronomy 16 about Tabernacles? Right off the bat, verse 1. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after you have gathered in the corn and the wine. When you have gathered in the corn and the wine. There's a second corn. What corn, what wheat is ready at the same time as wine. Hmm. Wine, grapes harvest, is ready September to October. The spring wheat harvest is ready from late summer to early fall, September to October. Remember, I've said that already about three times. The spring wheat, which is the younger Rachel wheat, is the one harvested in September to October, and it's harvested at the same time frame as grapes are being harvested. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, it says you're going to observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after you have gathered in the corn and wine. What corn is this? Spring wheat. The new wheat. Remember what happens? The spring wheat is brought in in September to October. The grapes are brought in September to October is the time frame, depending on the year. This year it would be October because everything's later, right? And it's the spring wheat. What do we know about this wheat? What do we know about the spring Rachel wheat? We know that the spring wheat cannot be observed. It can be brought in, but it can't be used until the following year on the second day of Passover. So what does that tell us in our chart? A lot of people are probably saying, 
Oh, so the pre-trib is going, and then four months later, the, the great multitude. No. You see, every year, there's a winter wheat and a spring wheat. A winter wheat and a spring wheat. A winter wheat and a spring wheat. Winter wheat and a spring wheat. But remember what I said earlier. Leah and Rachel are prophetic pictures in the end of days of winter wheat and spring wheat. Leah, the winter wheat at the Feast of Weeks, at the end of seven weeks, goes pre-trib at the Feast of Weeks. Rachel, he serves the additional time for. And what is her picture? Her picture is spring wheat. The spring wheat at the end of six years of seals is what? The end of six years of seals is the day and hour no one knows, Feast of Trumpets, the time frame when grapes and spring wheat are brought in. Okay? Which means on this line, the Feast of Trumpets time frame, wheat and grapes are brought in. And what do we know about Revelation 7? The grapes are brought in first, right? The grapes are brought in first, the 144,000. And then the wheat, even though it's ready, what do we know about the wheat? It tells us that it cannot be used because it's still called new until halfway through the seventh year of seals on the second day of Passover. You see? There's the end of the sixth year. Feast of Trumpets. The grapes and the wheat, the spring wheat, are ready to be brought in. But there's about six or seven months, right? That five to seventh month range before that wheat that was ready at the Feast of Trumpets time, being harvested at the time of grapes. It cannot be used until halfway through the year on the second day of Passover of the following year. That is Rachel Spring Wheat. It starts with Leah Wheat as the first fruits of the Feast of weeks pre-trib luke leia the the samaritan woman the the samaritan man the 10 percent of the church then you have your seals judgments and at the end of six years of seals tribulation at the feast of trumpets the grapes 144 and the Rachel, spring wheat, are ready to be harvested and brought, or being brought in. But, just like Ezekiel chapter 39 says, that even though it's come to the end, that Ezekiel 39 war, it says they're going to be burying bones for seven months. So if you go Feast of Trumpets, at the end of six to start the seventh year, and you add seven months, you get to second Passover of the following year. About six months in, right? About seven months if it's second Passover, because that one's still to be fulfilled. And what wheat can now be observed? Rachel. Rachel wheat. Spring wheat. That's when it's observed. So when does it come in? It's ready at the time of trumpets and it's being all brought in. It has to be brought in with the grapes before tabernacles. So if we know this is the time frame, okay, late September into middish October, any given year, this is when 
the spring wheat and grapes are ready. And we have scripture that even tells us tabernacles is before tabernacles is observed, the spring wheat, the corn and the wine are being brought in. And we know that they're both the ones that are harvested together. And we know that the seven weeks is when you begin to put the sickle <coughs> to the winter wheat. Are you are you yet seeing where the Jews have had their problem? You understanding where the Jews have the issue that's going wrong? Let me show you. I've shared this over the past from hopeofisrael.org, the two wheat harvests. Winter wheat, here it is again. Winter wheat is planted in late fall, early winter, and is harvested in late spring to early summer. Just like everything we've been saying. Since winter wheat is planted before Passover and harvested after Passover, it is always Yoshon, which means old. Okay? Which means it's old wheat. It can be used at any time without restriction. That's why when the winter wheat is harvested in late spring early summer when it's the not it's not the it's not the end of the harvest late spring early summer is the beginning of the harvest when the seven weeks from when the sickle is put to the winter wheat in late spring early summer the seven weeks begin when those seven weeks are done that is the Feast of Weeks. That wheat is called Yoshon, which means old wheat and has no restrictions and can be used and loaves of bread baked with it right away with leaven. Spring wheat, on the other hand, is planted in the spring and is harvested late summer, early fall, just like we just have been explaining. Since spring wheat is usually planted after Passover, one must wait until the following Passover before spring wheat becomes Yoshon. Why? Because it's called Kadosh, which means new. It's new wheat. New wheat can't be used right away. So what do the Jews do? Okay? Since the spring wheat is Kadosh, which means new, reaches the marketplace, at summer's end, Kadosh restrictions begin at the end of summer and last until the following Passover. Once on the second day of Passover passes, the prohibited Kadosh grain are halalically transformed into Yoshon grains and are permitted to be eaten after Passover until the end of summer, all Kadosh related problems. Okay, that that solves the issue. So you have winter wheat, which is called old wheat, and you have spring wheat, which is called new wheat. Winter wheat is Leah. Spring wheat is Rachel. Now listen to what happens. Watch this. And there I go to fall. Watch this. Okay. The spring wheat is sown in spring and harvested. Well, let's go right here. Winter wheat is sown in the fall and harvested in spring. Well, see, now he just says spring, but we know it's late spring, early summer, as he said earlier. Okay. About two weeks after barley harvest. Then spring wheat is sown in the spring and harvested in summer. Well, we know it's late summer, early fall. When? About four months later. When? Four months later. Just in case you didn't hear that. Four months later. What wheat is being harvested? You see, harvested, not completed its harvest. When is spring wheat being harvested? It is being harvested four months later from when winter wheat began to be harvested. 
when is spring wheat, uh, sorry, when is Leia winter wheat being harvested? Okay. We say any time from late May into middish late June. Well, what's four months later? Late September into middish late October. Four months later. What do the Jews mix up? What don't the Jews use? This is where it gets awesome. The Jews don't even consider using winter wheat. They wait for the spring wheat, which is harvested in late summer, early fall. They wait for the second harvest of wheat, which is spring wheat, ready in late summer, early fall to begin its harvest, that when it's harvested, they wait to use it the following Passover on the second day when it becomes Yoshon. What? Why have they done this? Why are they using spring wheat from the previous year in the fall and saying we cannot use it and observe it until the second day of Passover in the following year? Why do they use that wheat? For the exact same reason Jesus is telling them in John chapter 4. Samaria, Jacob, Jacob's well. The Jews, why is a Jew talking to me? Why is a Jew talking to a Samaritan woman? Why is a Jew talking to this Samaritan who is a, who is a stranger? Why, why, no, Jews don't talk to us. Who, who, does she, who did I say she represents? She represents Leah. Remember Jacob didn't want Leah? When he worked those first seven years, he was working for Rachel. And he was all excited for the beautiful younger Rachel. But he got Leah. He got the older before the younger. What did we read? You remember this? In Judges 15, the same story. <clears throat> right? Uh, and it came to pass within a while after in the time of wheat harvest. That Samson visited his wife with a kid, and he said, I will go in unto my wife into the chamber. But her father would not let him go in. And her father said, Verily I thought you utterly hated her. Therefore I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister prettier than she? You see, he had the older one. He didn't, he didn't want her. And even the father realized that he didn't really like her. But he had come back and he was ready to go into go into her in the chamber. And their father's like, no, I know you really don't like her. You wanted the younger, prettier one, so here she is. It's the same story as Leah and Rachel with Jacob. It's the same story as what Jesus is telling them in John chapter 4. The Samaritan woman is Leah. And why are you paying attention to this? To this Leah, you Jewish man who is always desiring the Rachel. And all of the, the, when the apostles are coming back and they can't believe that he's talking to this Leah Samaritan woman because they're all Jews, what are they looking for? Jesus says, Do you guys realize you keep saying the harvest is in? four months why are they saying the harvest is in four months because they're looking for the rachel harvest they're jews looking for the rachel harvest jesus is a jew also who would be looking for the rachel harvest because he as a jacob type isn't coming for the leah the ones that are already saved in christ spirit filled He's coming for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
But what does he know? He knows that there's a harvest that is four months earlier. And he's telling them, look, you're thinking there's a harvest coming in four months. I'm telling you, look, lift up your eyes. Look on these fields that are around us. They're already white to harvest. Not already harvested. They're ready to harvest. What is ready to harvest four months earlier than where they're thinking, thinking in a Rachel context, because they're all Jews, Jesus knows there's a Samaritan woman, the, the Gentile Leia unwanted type, who is already devout to him, and he's saying, look, when do you think he's telling them this? You better believe it. He's telling them in the month where the winter wheat that comes four months early is beginning its seven Sabbath week harvest. This doesn't mean we go here. This is the beginning of the harvest. And the Feast of Weeks from the Lord God's count in Taurus ends right here. But the beginning of the harvest begins here where Jesus is telling them, lift up your eyes and look. It's not four months from now. There's one already ready to harvest, white like Luke. The Jews have missed it because all of the Jews, even the apostles back in those days, were looking for the harvest being ready four months later because their focus is always what? Rachel. Want me to prove to you that, Re that Leah is the Feast of Weeks? Watch this. In Leah's story, we see that Leah's story, he ends up what? He ends up getting the older before the younger. So the winter wheat comes first. That harvest begins four months earlier than when the other one begins. And what does it say? Fulfill her week. What week is this? It's the wedding week, right? For us, we know it's the wedding week from the Feast of Weeks, Seventh Sabbath, and then there's the seven-day wedding. Remember what we saw? Remember even what it said in the Book of Jubilees? Now when we find the true third month, there they are at the Well of Oath on the seventh day or eighth day. Jacob's there. He remains there for seven days. And during that time, it's the celebration of the old grain Leah harvest. When we actually find it, it's right here in what the Lord God would call the third month. There's your pre-trib. There's your seven days where he's waiting. And then he returns on the eighth day, which is the 16th day. And the true third month after having waited in those seven days, like the, like the remnant bride that will remain waiting for the Lord when he returns. And during that week, it's the celebration of the first fruits of old grain. When this happened in Jacob's time, this was what we now call the month of Av. Yet it just so happens that the wheat harvests of the earth and the grape harvests of the earth reveal the exact same true count from the Lord God's beginning in the month of Savan from the beginning of creation where we would find the end to discover the beginning because in the beginning, there the end is. And when we get there, we now have the count of the true Leah, Samaritan woman, Samaritan man that the Jews don't even consider whose harvest begins four months earlier than when the harvest of Rachel begins. 
And do you know how the Jews have screwed it all up? I just explained it. They're all looking for Rachel. Their focus, just as Jesus told them, is saying, hey, you think that harvest is coming in four months? Why are they focused on the one coming four months from now? Because they're looking for Rachel. Their desire, every Jew's desire is Rachel. And Jesus is telling them, hey, Leah's harvest is beginning here. Seven Sabbaths, seven weeks, and I'm getting my Leah bride first. You see? And it doesn't mean the Rachel one comes right away. The Rachel one will be at the end of the sixth year of seals and will come in at this time, but can't be observed until Passover of the following year. And quite probably second Passover in the seventh year of seals. So look at this. If we've understood this and we know that this is the time of the true feast of weeks to the father. And this is the the Leah end of Leah's harvest when the feast of weeks happens and it begins her seven day wedding and then him coming on the 16th day of the Lord's third month. Check this out. Deuteronomy 16, 9, seven weeks shall thou observe. So the word weeks, right? Seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as you beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks of the Lord thy God. Want me to prove to you? It's Leah. Watch this. The very first place the word weeks shows up is in Genesis 29, verse 27 and 28. When it says fulfill her week, we know that that is Leah's wedding week, correct? Not Rachel's, Leah's. The search of 7620 was the search I did for the seven weeks of the count of the Feast of Weeks. And it revealed the first two places it shows up in all of Scripture begins in Genesis 29, 27. Leah's wedding week. That happens at the end of what? The Feast of Weeks of the winter wheat harvest Leah for which he will fulfill her week from the feast of weeks will fulfill her wedding week and then the lord shows up on the 16th day of the lord god's true third month now let me end with showing you how the jews have screwed it up <clears throat> how they have misunderstood it okay it even tells you here, look at this. What is Shavuot supposed to be? Okay, Shavuot, or what they call Feast of Weeks. Shavuot marks the giving of the Torah, and it's the first fruits festival of what? The wheat harvest. So they're, they know it. They know it's the first fruits of the wheat harvest. But what they have failed to comprehend is that you're not supposed to count it using spring wheat. You're not supposed to count it using Rachel. You're supposed to count it using Leah, who is winter wheat. But they are so blinded by not wanting Leah, by not desiring the ten and, and the Samaritans and, and all those ten tribes, <clears throat> we're like their enemies. So what have the Jews done? They've completely mixed up and screwed up their count because they've been using Leah. Uh, sorry, they've been using Rachel. 
listen what they've do what they've done it even says it they've been using the kadosh which is the 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 spring wheat and they've been waiting until the following passover so what did they do here's what they do check it out there's your second day of passover <clears throat> Here's your second day of Passover. They call it what? The counting of the Omer. From the counting of the Omer, they do this count until what? There's the 49th day of the counting of the Omer, and then what they call the 50th day of what? The Feast of Weeks. Which means this, what they call seven-week count to the Feast of Weeks, what are they using to count it with? What are they using? They're using Rachel. <clears throat> They're using Rachel wheat to count it. <clears throat> They're using the wheat that began to be harvested in the seventh month. And when this harvest comes in, <clears throat> they know that they're not allowed to use it because it's new wheat. So they're waiting till the following year on the second day of Passover. And they're saying, now is the beginning of the count because the spring wheat is now Yoshon on the second day of Passover the following year. So because it's Yoshon on the second day of Passover, they're now counting using Rachel wheat. They're counting seven weeks and then they're declaring the Feast of Weeks. Do you see how awesome that is? They've completely blinded themselves to Leah. If they understood that Leah is being harvested here, that this is the beginning of the spring wheat uh sorry of the winter wheat leia and you count your seven weeks you would end up here where the actual leia winter wheat is harvested where it where it's the end of the harvest and this would be your true seventh sabbath from what from when you begin to put the sickle to the corn, then it's the Feast of Weeks. Remember what I said? There is no way they can put the sickle to the wheat back in March to April on the second day of Passover. There is no wheat to put the sickle to. But they know that they have to use Yoshon wheat. So instead of saying, wait a second, maybe we shouldn't be using Rachel wheat for our count because we can't actually put the sickle to the wheat here because there is no wheat. Maybe what we should do is go to the winter wheat count. And when we go to the winter wheat count, end up at the true feast of weeks where the winter wheat is that is already Yoshon. You see, from the winter wheat count, when the harvest begins, and you can literally put the sickle to the winter wheat because it is literally ready to get the sickle put to and you do it for the seven weeks you end up at the actual end of the true feast of weeks and it is yoshon wheat and yoshon wheat is the wheat that can be used right away baked with leaven and brought to the Lord for the wave offerings. What the Jews have done 
is have eliminated even considering Leah. Just like the woman at the well. Just like the Samaritan who turned. Just like Samson's story. Just like Jacob's story. Just like any Jewish person you go to who doesn't want Leah, they all want Rachel. They've so corrupted their thoughts and their minds to Rachel that they've abandoned the fact that Scripture says you have to put the sickle to the wheat to begin the count. What they've done is they've taken, even though they've put the sickle to the wheat of Leah in late summer, early fall, they can't use it until the second day of Passover when it's no longer Kadosh, but can now be called Yoshon. And so they say, here, we're using Rachel wheat, even though it's not when it's the beginning of the harvest of wheat when you can put the sickle to it. They're using grain in an Omer container, in a measuring unit. They're putting the, lay, uh, the, the Rachel wheat and they're using this count from Rachel because it's impossible because they can't put the sickle to the wheat. So the Lord told them in Deuteronomy 16 how they're supposed to do it to the true Feast of Weeks. But what they've done is they've gone to the Feast of Tabernacles or the, the wheat harvest before the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the one with the wine. And they said, we're taking this wheat because this one represents Rachel. Do they know it represents Rachel? I'll bet you they're blinded to it. Because you would think they would much rather observe their feasts in order. But just like it told us, even in the book of Jubilees, they will go astray from their harvest. And in this one, we can reveal that they're going astray in harvest is because all of their focus is on Rachel that they've abandoned the true understanding of the Feast of Weeks connected to Leah, and they've gone to the Feast of, uh, before the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the Rachel wheat, and they're keeping it all dried up in little vessels, and when it becomes like the actual Leah wheat was, which was ready to be used right away, Yashon, they're waiting on this Kadosh one to be ready the following year on the second day of Passover. And then they're using this one to begin a count of seven weeks to what they call is the Feast of Weeks. It's not true. I have proven to you with the harvests where the true Feast of Weeks is, where it begins where the celebration is and it is lay a winter wheat and then you have your seven day wedding your seven day week for the wedding just as leah had and then the lord comes on the 16th day which is the eighth day when he will begin his 40 days those 40 days will end on the 26th of elul if this all takes place in 2024 it will be not many days, three days to the Holy Ghost anointing. When what? When new wine is ready. New wine comes in what? September to October. The exact same time where spring wheat is now also being harvested, but it's not the harvest year in the model for Rachel for another six years. This is now the time of Acts chapter 2, when they are drunken on new wine or being accused of being drunk on new wine because this is the time of the harvest of the grapes and the seven years of seals begin. When the first six years come to an end, here you go. The grapes are ready again. <clears throat> the spring wheat of Rachel is ready. But even though this is the time of their harvest, just like it said that it had to happen before be brought in before tabernacles can start at the end of those six years it's the day and hour no one knows the grapes ready for harvest the 
spring wheat is ready for harvest, but it's not going to be used right away because it won't be used until the second day of Passover and probably because Passover has been fulfilled by the Lord, it probably won't be until the second day of Passover or the second Passover in the seventh year of seals, which is the seven months where the bones are being buried as we see after the Ezekiel 39 war. Brothers and sisters, please, please take your time to go through these things. Pause it, follow it, rewind it. You can reach out to me in the forum. You can reach out by email. Maybe we'll do uh, a live show next and we'll discuss these things and people can ask their questions and, and we can go through it step by step to specific questions that people have. But you just witnessed here <clears throat> that why Jesus in John chapter 4 is telling them <clears throat> that there is a harvest of wheat already ready four months before what you're looking for <clears throat> is because he is telling them that the Leah Samaritan woman Gentile bride is ready that this harvest of them begins four months before the one they're looking for. But it doesn't mean that the start of this harvest is the pre-trib. He's saying that this harvest that begins four months before the harvest you're all looking for is the harvest that comes first. That is going to be the beginning of when the sickle is put to the Leia winter wheat. That is going to begin the one that's four months earlier. But it is not going to be the pre-trib until the end at the Feast of True Feast of Weeks. It is the mystery of John chapter 4 when Jesus says, yet four months. And it is a direct picture of a Leah type being at Jacob's well, being a Samaritan woman where a Jew wouldn't pay attention to a Samaritan woman because she's not a quote unquote Rachel type. And what do we see? The exact same story. And from it, we know that a remnant portion of them remains, as I've shared, where it says, And he that reapeth receives wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. This group rejoicing together with the Lord is the remnant workers that will rejoice and be rewarded and glorified together, ruling and reigning with the Lord in his throne with him, as he is in the Father's with his. Brothers and sisters, I pray that blesses you. I pray that you have understood it. I pray that you have followed it. I was so blown away when I realized, wait a second, they call it an Omer count, because they have this measured unit of seeds in it. And in it, they're using a count like a spring wheat Rachel. And they have waited for it to be Yoshon. And said, see, now it's Yoshon. Because it's last year's that was planted after Passover. So by the time it was harvested and we come to this year, it is now going to be Yoshon. All because of Rachel. Because the Jews don't like or recognize Leah. And who do the Jews don't like or recognize? Christians in Christ. Because the Christians in Christ are Leah. They are the Samaritan woman. They are the one of ten that are going pre-trib 
that have cried out to Christ in repentance and worshipped him and fallen at his feet. And the Jews don't look to him. The Jews don't look to the Christians. That's why they what? Don't they hate the Christian? Really, behind the scenes? They're happy to take their money, but quote unquote, overall, generally. Remember, the scripture said they are our enemies for our sakes. Just like what? They hated Ra uh, Leah. He hated Leah. Samson hated that one. The Jews don't like them. The Jews don't like Christians. It's the exact same picture. And the reason they've miscounted and done this is for the exact same reason. And it seems to have been the case for thousands of years in the prophetic picture all the way through from the was in Genesis to the is when Christ was there with the apostles speaking to the Samaritan woman. He was giving an exact same replay picture of Leah to Rachel. The exact same. And here we are ready in the is to come with the revelation from the was from the is because as ecclesiastes 1 9 says what was shall be what is shall be what happened in genesis 29 was what happened in john 4 is and the is to come will be both of them put together in the revealed prophetic picture and here it was tonight man oh man thank you lord thank you holy spirit for working through us Thank you for revealing us, uh, revealing the scriptures and drawing us closer and closer and closer as we diligently seek them and watch for that glorious day when we will prayerfully be accounted worthy to be uh, accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man in the lowest room of the third heaven or be girded about ready and waiting to serve him when he returns from the wedding brothers and sisters i believe all of that happens by august of 2024 and if it happens earlier we are ready we are watching but i'm telling you add this to everything else that's revealed and this falls in the exact same prophetic revelation line of the entirety of it not one piece was out of place in this revelation either and try and tell me we think it's going to be april or may or march i'm watching always and i believe each and every one of us are watching always i know i don't understand everything but the things that we know for a fact that have been revealed and every other part and piece that is revealed and built on top of it has revealed the exact same picture. Always in its place. So as much as I am watching every single day and I would love it to be before I get this video out, I believe we have the picture. I absolutely believe we have the prophetic picture. Now, all that I have hoped and prayed for is that we have truly understood that it is, in fact, indeed, going to be 2024 as the Jubilee count and the 70th year of Jerusalem and all of these other things have revealed. Brothers and sisters, it's going to be a ride. And can you imagine being a servant for the Lord when he returns from the wedding being girded about. That your reward in Christ serving him for his people, the lost sheep. Is going to be to sit in his throne as a co-heir with him. During the millennial reign. That is unfathomable. But that's what's coming. For those who will serve him. Guys. I am so grateful. I love you all. I love you always. I'm praying for you and for your families. I thank you for all your prayers over us, over the ministry, over Steve and his team in Uganda, over all of them that they're reaching for, for your prayers that are just reaching thousands and thousands of people that you have no idea of. Thousands, tens of thousands now. 
it is having a huge impact and I am so grateful, so honored and that I get to do it with all of you. Brothers and sisters, I love you again. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.